Hi, this is Heather and Aishan, and welcome to our immune system video. In this video, we're going to talk about the primary and secondary immune responses and some real-life applications. Think of the primary and secondary immune responses as soccer teams. The first time you play another team, you don't know how they play. They come onto the field and they're strangers. They could be great players, they could be horrible. You don't know what their moves are like, so you don't know how to alter yourselves to beat them. So it'll take you a good half of the game to get yourselves together to possibly beat them. But if you play them a second time, you can quickly start playing hard because you remember how they played before. The primary immune response is the first time you play them, and the secondary immune response is the next time. Primary immune response, the response that occurs after a harmful antigen has been encountered for the first time. Secondary immune response, much quicker and more effective response that occurs after a previously encountered antigen reappears. But let's step back a little. Before we can talk about the immune responses, we have to talk about the lines of defense. Our bodies have three lines of defense. The first line of defense is intact, not broken, skin, mucous membranes, and their secretions such as your nose and mucus. The second line is where we're really going to start. The second line of defense falls under what we call innate immunity. Innate immunity consists of the nonspecific defense mechanisms the body employs to fight a pathogen, such as phagocytic white blood cells, antimicrobial substances, and the processes of inflammation and fever. If innate immunity fails to mollify the pathogen, the third line of defense is called up. The third line of defense consists of specific defense mechanisms, specialized lymphocytes and B and T cells that directly or indirectly by its specific antigens. With a third line of defense, we need to talk about adaptive immunity. Adaptive immunity is the body's ability to recognize and defend itself against distinct invaders and their products. Adaptive immunity has four key features that we'll mention briefly. One, it is specific and focuses on antigens that are present. Two, it is diverse and responds to a wide variety of pathogens by activating specific lymphocytes from a pool. Three, it has the ability to distinguish self from non-self. Four, lastly, it has immunological memory to respond to a later exposure to a pathogen. All of these features play a huge part in the primary and secondary responses. This diagram is one that you should see many times throughout your study of the immune system and responses. It is our teacher's favorite. The first time a harmful antigen is encountered in the body, it triggers the primary immune response. There are three phases in the adaptive immune response. One, recognition, two, activation, and three, effector. In the recognition phase, once an antigen enters the system and is detected by the body, a phagocytic cell rushes to engulf the antigen. A phagocytic cell engulfs the antigen. Inside the phagosome, the phagocyte with the antigen inside, an endocytic vessel forms around the particle and then fuses with a lysosome which carries digestive enzymes and the particle is digested. An AMHC class 2 marker then binds with the fragments of the digested antigen forming an antigen MHC complex which is displayed on the cell's surface making it an antigen presenting cells. This process is demonstrated by the arrow and red circle in the diagram. Activation phase. From there, a T-cell's receptor recognizes the complex and binds, stimulating helper and cytotoxic T-cells. Alternately, a B-cell may encounter the antigen before it is even digested by the phagocyte. Either way, the binding of the epitope of the antigen or the antigen MHC complex with a specific B or T cell, antigen binding selects it for proliferation. This activates it and then it proliferates to generate a clone, a process called clonal selection. Shown in the diagram is an antigen binding to a specific B cell, choosing the specific cell with the right receptor for proliferation. The cells then go through clonal selection, then are able to turn into plasma cells which secrete antibodies, which have the correct receptors and memory cells to store the response to the specific antigen. 
The activation phase described above is demonstrated by the red arrows where the antigen either specifically stimulates the B cell or the antigen presenting cell stimulates the helper T cells and the cytotoxic T cells. Effector phase. Primary immune response. When an antigen is first encountered, naive lymphocytes proliferate to produce two types of cells, effector and memory cells. The activated B cells, helper T cells, and cytotoxic T cells now give rise to two different cells, effector cells that carry out the attack and memory cells, which are long-lived cells that can divide on short notice to produce effector and more memory cells. These effector cells are the primary immune response. Effector B cells, plasma cells, secrete antibodies which reside in the plasma and help to indirectly fight the antigen as part of humoral immunity. Effector T cells secrete cytokines and other molecules to fight the invading antigen, cell-mediated immunity. For many days after an antigen has entered the body, there are no antibodies produced in the bloodstream to fight the antigen. This is a lag period. During this period, the lymphocytes have to go through everything circled in red. This takes a few days and therefore is a slow immune response. But soon, specialized active cytotoxic T cells and antibodies specific for the harmful antigen begin to appear in the bloodstream and increase until they level off and then slowly decrease until the antibodies are barely detectable. The memory cells created are part of immunological memory. The immune system remembers a pathogen after the first encounter. This gives the immune system the ability to initiate the secondary immune response, when antigen is encountered again, memory cells proliferate and launch an army of plasma cells and effector T cells. The secondary immune response is much faster because, as the diagram shows, you can skip everything in red, moving on to the stimulation of memory cells, which gives rise to the effector cells. This graph is really important. For biology or any immunology class, you should be able to explain it if prompted. The x-axis describes time. From the initial exposure, there is a lag period where the antigen or antigen-presenting cells has to stimulate the B and T cells and they have to go through clonal selection, which then gives rise to effector cells that are slow and produce less antibodies. The y-axis describes the antibody concentration. The second time, the memory cells can call up effector cells quickly and more effectively to produce more antibodies to fight the pathogen. Uh, okay. This is Hannah. Hannah represents a virus. This is Aishin. Aishin represents the host or the patient. It takes Aishin some time to be able to stop Hannah. In the secondary immune response, because of the memory cells, Aishin is able to quickly defeat Hannah. One real life application of primary and secondary immune responses are vaccines. Vaccines work by triggering a primary immune response. They act like the first exposure to the antigen without making you sick. The immune system recognizes vaccine agents as foreign, destroys them, and proliferates memory cells to later fight them. Therefore, it is able to call up the secondary immune response faster to fight the pathogen you received the vaccine for.